And we're back. Uh, welcome. I hope uh, this round is going to be uh, technically a little bit less squawk than the last one, which was really unfortunate. So apologies again to our speaker there. Our next speaker, uh, which is Gabe Ocker, who is a professor at BU University. Uh, and he will talk about um, his work, which is largely in the space of uh, uh, SCDP and spiking neural networks and, and, and balance and correlation and mean field theory galore. And I'm very much looking forward uh, to your talk and I'm uh, really glad that you could join us. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you, Friedemann, for the, the kind introduction and, and to all the organizers for the introduction. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a, a few different uh, interrelated topics, or, or at least I hope you'll find them related, um, in, in the theme of, of plasticity activity and, and hopefully computation even uh, in neuronal networks. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm a theoretical neuroscientist. I'm primary, primarily interested in kind of how, how uh, biological neural networks uh, learn, develop, uh, and compute and how the dynamics of those neurons and the structure of those networks kind of interact with each other um, through learning. Now, biological um, learning, or, and when I say learning, I'm, I'm referring to synaptic plasticity, long-term synaptic plasticity, is kind of horrendously complicated, right? It, it involves the interplay of, of all these kind of um, biological or biochemical pathways in uh, dendritic spines and in presynaptic boutons and, and between them, um, which is, you know, and, and there are people, right? People who are who are braver than me, um, who who really dive into that uh, that complexity and model the, um, the 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 complicated kind of biochemical cascades that underlie synaptic plasticity. I um, prefer to take a, a simpler approach, um, a, a more tractable approach, or, or one at least more tractable to me. Um, really inspired by some some early work from uh, from actually from Friedemann's PhD advisor Wolfgang Gerstner and uh, and collaborators of his um, right so back in in 2002 um, Gerstner and Kistler uh, suggested that we view these complicated dynamics of synaptic plasticity um, as basically some functionals right we have some changes in the synaptic weight DJ right of the synapse from neuron little j to neuron i um, and there are changes that are triggered by postsynaptic spikes, right? N dot I is the, the spike train of neuron I. Um, and changes triggered by presynaptic spikes. And when either of those spikes happen, right, maybe there's some kind of um, a variable at the synapse, right? It could be a presynaptic variable or a postsynaptic variable, um, which, which tells the synapse whether to potentiate or depress and, and how much so. And those variables here, right, the X and Y are themselves functionals of the history of, of pre and postsynaptic activity. Um, right, and we can take those and expand them, right, in a Volterra series. Um, so we might have contributions to that trace from uh, that depend only on the postsynaptic activity or that depend on um, kind of the second moments of the postsynaptic activity or on the presynaptic activity and so on. And if we isolate kind of one of these terms, right, that there's a change in the synaptic weight driven by the, the conjunction of pre and postsynaptic activity, this sort of whole kind of general expansion of this, of our, our unknown biological plasticity rule reduces to a, a simple kind of pair-based spike timing dependent plasticity model, right? These kind of classic models from um, the late 80s, uh, sorry, the late 90s and, and early 2000s, right, where you have changes in the synaptic weights, either potentiation or depression, driven by uh, pairs of spikes, right, in the pre and postsynaptic cell. Okay. So we can also extend this formulation, right, to kind of uh, the more complicated uh, terms and the expansions of, of these activity traces, um, right? You can have terms that depend on uh, the rate of the postsynaptic neuron or on the activity of third neurons, right? That might be signaling reward or, or error signals if you're in re reinforcement or, or supervised learning settings. For now, I'm going to stick to the kind of simplest unsupervised uh, learning setting uh, and this kind of simple pair-based spike timing dependent plasticity model. And now, again, um, right, following, following um, Gerstner's approach, um, if the changes in the synaptic weight driven by individual pairs of spikes are small, 
then the learning is slow, right? It takes a long time for, for changes in the synaptic weight to accumulate to kind of observable uh, levels, right? So if changes in the synaptic weight are very small, we have a slow learning and that slow learning averages over the activity of the pre and post synaptic neuron, right? So these angle brackets here denote averaging. So now at a, right, at, at, as the learning is very slow at any instant in time, we have um, kind of the current state of the neural network. Um, and to determine how that changes, we need to calculate the joint statistics, right, of neurons, of neurons activity in that network. So we need some way to calculate Right, for example, this this second moment, um, right, the expectation of, of n dot i, n dot j. Um, and if there are questions, right, at any point, if anything's unclear, please, you know, as, as Freedom has said in the chat, hammer away. Um, and if there's something really, if I'm really, really unclear about something or um, there's something urgent, I'll, I'll try and, um, and address it. Um, before I lose all of you. So, so we need some framework, right, from for going from the network structure, right, the, the J's, the synaptic weights that link the neurons in our network to the activity of the pre and post synaptic neurons. Right. And now there are there are different approaches we could take here, right? And the, the in general, right, we'll have to do this, we'll have to specify a model, right, for that the activity of those neurons, right? Like how these these end dots, how these spike trains get generated and how they depend on the synaptic weights J, right? And so on. One approach to this is um, fairly general, right? And it was kind of developed in, in back, again, back in the, the 2000s, the early 2000s, um, by my PhD advisor, Brent Boron, um, and later, um, right, uh, really fleshed out, um, especially by this, this uh, paper by James Truesdale, uh, Yuhu um, et al. In, uh, in 2011 in Plus Comp Bio. And the idea here is that we take our, the, our spike trains and we kind of expand them around some, some background state, right? That here I'm calling R, right? R is kind of a, a baseline or a background uh, state for these spike trains. And we say that the activity of, our, of, our, of each neuron, right, is given by that baseline plus its response, its linear response to the inputs that that neuron receives, right? So here A is a linear response function or transfer function uh, of that neuron. Right, and the stars here are convolutions, right? So this is a function that, you know, a, a, a function that depends on time, right? So you have inputs, synaptic inputs coming in and the neuron responds to them. So this, this linear response framework gives us a way to, to calculate the activity of the neurons, um, right? In particular, we can just, you know, um, isolate the n dots, right? That the whole vector of n dots on one side of this equation and multiply it, right, by its, its uh, it's transpose that vector by its transpose and take expectations to compute the, the correlation matrix of the spike trains. And we get this kind of this uh, this linear response formula that that here I'm I'm writing in the frequency in the temporal frequency domain, right? Assuming kind of a stationary uh, background or baseline state for the neurons. Right. So here we have the, the correlation matrix of the spike trains. Right. And it depends on these linear response functions, the A's. It depends on the the structure of the network, right? That whole matrix, the J, right? The synaptic weights J, and it depends on this kind of baseline state, right? On the on the the variability of this baseline state, the joint second moment of the the baselines. Now, right? I, I've told you we can, you know, we can write down this formula, right? But of course, in order to use this, we need to be able to compute these these terms that appear, right? In order in order for me to tell you what the, the joint second moment of the spike trains is, right, that drives the, the plasticity due to, due to the STDP rule, I need to tell you what A is, and I need to tell you what the variability of the baseline is. So now we, we do need to specify a model, and, and, it, and we can do this um, in, for the family of kind of integrate and fire models, right, under a, a, a particular approximation, right? And that approximation, oh, sorry, before I tell you about the approximation, this, it works, right? We can do this and, and it works uh, quite well. Um, we can predict the, you know, the shape of the, of the cross-correlation functions between pairs of neurons, right, in a, in a big recurrent network. Um, so how do we compute these things? How do we compute the, the baseline variability or the, the linear response functions? One classic way is to do it through a diffusion approximation. So we assume that each neuron is receiving a large number of inputs, right? And these are coming from the rest of the network, right? And we approximate all of those, those incoming, those afferent spike trains as just homogeneous Poisson processes. And we sum them up 
and get a, a Gaussian, a white input current, right? And that basically allows us to write down um, a Fokker-Planck equation, right? An equation that governs the probability distribution of each neuron's membrane potential. And we can use that to, to extract these things that we need, right? The baseline variability and the linear response function. I'm not going to go through, through all the details, but the key step here is you can make that diffusion approximation, right? And that lets you basically plug and chug with this, this kind of Fokker-Planck machinery to calculate the things that you need, right, for this linear response theory. All right. So you can do that, right? We do that. And then so we can calculate the spike train correlations and the SDP rule, right? That tells us how synaptic weights change, right? And so we can kind of now close the loop between activity and plasticity in this recurrent network right? um, under this separation of time scales, right? The slow learning. So this, again, right, this, this works um, quite well, right? We can predict the, the average evolution of individual synaptic weights, like those between these three neurons in the network here over the kind of a long time scale. Um, and as the synaptic weights change, right, so do, does the amplitude of the correlations between the, the pre and postsynaptic neurons, right, which are marked by these the three um, little arrows on the time axis for the, the, the weight traces there. Um, corresponds to the shading of the correlations, right, at those three different time points in the right column here. And so we can use this to predict the, the evolution of individual synaptic weights, right, and how they're driven by, um, by, by activity in the network. Uh, and then we can leverage that to, to study learning, right, in these networks. For example, we can um, embed Hebbian assemblies uh, similar to, to what Friedemann did in his thesis, although here we're doing it with uh, kind of timing-based inputs. So we present uh, correlated inputs to groups of neurons, right, in this network, and we see the emergence of heavy and assemblies after a, a training period of about um, 20 simulated minutes, um, right, and we can use this kind of linear response framework to derive reduced descriptions, right, for the average strength of the assemblies or um, the average strength of higher order structure in this network, right? Um, so here on, in the bottom, I'm showing the, a phase plane that we derived, um, showing the relative average strength of within assembly versus between assembly connections. That's XSP delta, right? Delta for the difference between the within assembly and between assembly connections. And on the y-axis in those phase portraits in, in row E here, um, is the relative strength of reciprocal connections within an assembly versus reciprocal connections uh, between assemblies, right? So we can drive kind of a joint, a reduced low dimensional dynamics that also describes how connectivity motifs evolve in this network during spontaneous activity and during training. Yeah. Um, so this kind of, uh, of line of work is, um, is what I did in, in my thesis, um, right? And of course, others have worked on this also, right? Uh, in particular, um, Nederavid Tannenbaum and Joram Barak uh, published some very related work in 2016. And uh, Montanji in, in Juliana Georgieva's group in 2017 extended this approach to triplet spike time independent plasticity models. Um, in both of those cases, they worked not with integrated fire models, but with um, Hawks style like uh, point process models of the spike trains. Um, but it's, you know, the same kind of basic idea. Um, so, okay. So that's, um, that's, that's one approach right, to kind of closing the loop between activity and plasticity in, uh, in spiking networks, right, uh, one theoretical approach, right, where we can kind of write down some equations that tell us how the, syn the synaptic weights change, right, and how they control the spike time covariability. I'd like to return to um, the way that we did this, right. So I told you, right, that in order to calculate these these things we needed, right? In order to calculate the linear response function or the, the variability of the, these baseline states, we needed to make this diffusion approximation, right? In order to, to use this, this whatever fancy Fokker-Planck machinery um, to calculate these things, right? So we assume that the spike trains that a neuron receives are homogeneous Poisson processes and that they sum up to give a, a white input current. But of course, these spike trains are, are Large, many of them, right, are coming from within the recurrent network that we're modeling, right? And so if we, we, can, we can use the same approach to calculate the power spectrum of those spike trains, for example, right, and 
then we see we we face a problem, right? Which is those power spectra are not white, right? So this this whole approach is not self consistent, right? At the level of the the variability of the, of the second order statistics of the activity, right? This was pointed out in a in a really nice paper by Benji Lidner um, in two thousand six, right? That you take a whole bunch of that. So actually, Benji pointed out something another problem even, right? So I'm telling you that the output spike trains of the neurons in our network are not white, so we can't assume that they're homogeneous Poisson processes. And in 2006, Benji told us, he pointed out, even if they were Poisson processes, when you add them up, it wouldn't necessarily be white uh, in time. So, so the, the, like this whole approach, right? <laughs> like both steps of that approximation you know, it, it works under some conditions, right? But it's not self-consistent. And the way that I got it to work, right, is that I bathed my neurons in white noise. I said, you know, I have a recurrent network of a thousand neurons, um, but it's also receiving input from other neurons, right, outside of that local circuit, right? And I modeled those as, right, as uh, homogeneous Poisson processes, right, that, that drive actually a white noise. Um, so I got it to work by basically enforcing, right, the, the, the approximation that we made in the theory, right? So that's kind of cheating, right? So next I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, about a way we can do slightly better, right? And I'm gonna do this in the context of a, of a related model, um, which is a stochastic leaky integrating firing network. So here we have the, the membrane voltage dynamics of this, of this model. And it's, you know, just the classic uh, kind of leaky dynamics. Um, the main difference here is that we don't uh, have a hard threshold for spike emission, right? Rather, whenever the neuron, uh, the membrane voltage exceeds a threshold value, it has some probabilistic chance of spiking. So this is the stochastic part. We have, it's a leaky integrated fire network with stochastic spike emission, right? So we have kind of an output noise or an escape noise. Um, and then the last part of these dynamics up top, right, is that whenever the neuron spikes, its membrane potential is reset to a fixed value, right? So it's a, it, that part of it is, is the same as the classic integrate and fire dynamics. And this model is, is inspired, or we, we um, take the intensity function of these models, um, that mapping from the membrane voltage to the spike probability, right? We, um, we typically use threshold power law functions, right? Inspired by some, some really beautiful in vivo experiments from Nicholas Preby, um, where he actually recorded in vivo the average membrane potential in like the 20 milliseconds preceding a spike and observed these kind of really nice power law functions, um, typically with exponents between like two and five. Um, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a threshold linear intensity function um, just for simplicity. All right, so we have this, this network with stochastic spike emission. Um, and so can we do better, right, than this diffusion approximation in order to compute uh, statistics of its activity? Uh, and uh, of course the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't be talking to you um, about it. So the, the first point I'd like to make, right, is that even, even with this stochastic spike emission, um, we can have very reliable spike trains, right? So in these styles of, of stochastically spiking models, or um, here we actually don't have the hard reset, right? In these, uh, the, the figure um, here I'm showing is from this paper by Ali Weber and, and Jonathan Pillow. Um, they just had a, a classic kind of GLM, but even with that kind of model, you can reproduce these classic experiments from Manin and Sijnowski, right? Where the neuron responds very reliably to temporarily fluctuating inputs. Right, so you can have very reliable responses, even when the spike emission mechanism is, is stochastic, right? So, all right, so now we'd, we'd like to describe the statistics of activity, right, in the stochastic integrating fire network, right? And if we want to talk about plasticity, we need to know about activity statistics um, in this kind of slow learning framework. So the simplest statistic is, of course, the mean, right? So we can calculate the mean membrane potential um, or the evolution of the mean membrane potential right, just by averaging its equation of motion. Um, and if we expand out that term that arises from the spike reset, that last term in the membrane potential, right, we see that it gives rise to two terms here in the dynamics, right? We have that second moment, right, is of course you have the product of the means and then the second cube, like the covariance, right, between the membrane potential and the spike train. That's all that's happened here in, in the second line. Um, 
And similarly, right, if we wanted to um, compute statistics of the spike trains, right, well, we know that the expected, the rate of the spike trains, right, is just the expected intensity, right? And we can make a Taylor expansion of that intensity function f, assuming that we're not exactly at threshold, right? Um, because that's model, right, is, is non smooth at threshold. Um, Right, and, uh, and derive a similar formula. And of course, the simplest right, description, the simplest thing we could do would be to forget about all the higher cumulant, right? We could make a, a mean field um, description um, where we basically drop that last term, the covariance of the spike trains and membrane potentials. And there we get basically an effective rate network description of our spiking network, right? So this is a, if we have N neurons in our spiking network, here we have an N dimensional mean field theory, which takes the form of a rate network, like it's very similar to the classic like Amari Grossberg style equations for a rate network, except for this very last term, right, that comes from the spike resets. So we have an additional kind of multiplicative rate dependent leak, right, um, that shows up in our in the mean field theory of these networks. And this mean field theory uh, gives us a decent description of, of the activity in these networks here for single neurons. And we can, uh, um, in comparison, right, if we take a model with linear resets, um, right, we see kind of qualitatively different things. So this, the reset mechanism matters, of course. Um, we can also use this to describe kind of other, you know, things about recurrent networks, right, and by stability and, and just all that kind of fun stuff in them. Um, what I'd like to focus on here, though, right, is these, these, these fluctuations, right, that we neglected in the mean field theory, right? Like if we wanted to talk about spike timing dependent plasticity, we needed to know about the correlation between the pre and postsynaptic spike trains, right? And here, right, we threw away the covariance between the spike train, but an individual neuron spike train and membrane potential, right? So those both correspond to kind of um, second order statistics that we were, um, that we needed, right, before, and that we're neglecting now. But we don't have to neglect them. Right, we can we can take them into account uh, in a self consistent fashion, and that's what I'm I'm referring to in this bottom plot when I uh, draw this one loop line, um, which gives us actually a, a much better description of activity right in these um, you know in this simple kind of you know single neuron framework. Um, we can also make a and do an exact calculation by by drawing an analogy to a renewal process. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of that, right? You can see the um, the paper that I'll cite at the end for that. The point is, right, we, we, we want to calculate activity statistics, right? We want to calculate that covariance between the spike train and the membrane potential that came from the resets. Uh, or if we want to talk about learning, right, like we, like we do, we need to calculate correlations between the spike trains of individual neurons in these networks. Now, rather than making the kind of linear response approximation that I did um, right, that gave us a way to predict the, the two-point correlations, right, the, the second-order statistics. Unfortunately, that approach doesn't generalize to higher-order statistics. So if we want to talk about reward-modulated heavy in learning or supervised, right, learning or anything like that, that linear response framework doesn't, doesn't really do it for us, right, because we need, there you need to know also the activity of, third, of a third signal. So... I'm going to take a step back and say, well, I don't just want to know the statistics, right? I don't just want to know, well, the, the second moment, or I just don't just want to know the third moment. I want to know the whole joint density functional of the spike trains and membrane potentials, right? If I know this probability density in full, right, we can calculate whatever moment, whatever joint moment we want. Right? So fortunately, there exists a set of tools that allow us to do this. Right? or at least allow us to construct expansions right, for any moment we want, right? that we can then truncate to get approximate descriptions. And that approach is, is um, kind of a path integral approach for stoca stochastic um, dynamical systems um, that was developed in statistical field theory. Right? And there, are a few, there have been a few nice reviews on this subject uh, in, in recent years that I'm, I'm citing down here at the bottom, um, Carson Chow and Michael Bice in 2015, uh, John Hertz, uh, Yasser Rudy, and, and Solich in 2016, and Martilias and David Diamond wrote a nice wrote a nice textbook um, called Statistical Field Theory for Neural Networks, um, which goes through this kind of whole approach in detail. The essential idea is is very simple, right? We want this joint density probability density functional, and we know what the what the evolution of our model is, right? We know what our model is, right? We we chose it at the beginning, 
So that density is just a product of delta functions that enforce the evolution of the model that we defined, right? That's all the density is, right? So we just write that down and then introduce a Fourier representation of these delta functions, right? Uh, we marginalize out the auxiliary, sorry, I, I didn't tell you these eta it, right, are auxiliary, auxiliary random variables, um, right, so that this, that's, that second delta function uh, in the first line is just saying that the spike, right, neuron I emits a spike at time t by flipping a coin, right, and the outcome of that coin is this eta, right, a Bernoulli random variable. Um, so we, we marginalize out those auxiliary random variables and make a continuous time limit. And that lets us write down a path integral description of our neural network that takes this form, right? So the exponent of that density, right? Um, this functional I'm calling S is, uh, is referred to as the action usually, right? The first term that density is basically the delta function that enforces our membrane potential dynamics, right? You could have whatever dynamics you wanted in there, right? I have this, this, this simple leaky integrate and fire dynamics um, with the reset term, right, you could do anything. And then the second terms in the action, the n tilde n dot minus the exponent exponential of n tilde minus one times f of v, those terms correspond to the kind of Poisson spike emission of our neurons, right? So the first term is just the membrane potential dynamics. It could be whatever dynamics you want. The second term, the second uh, two terms are the, are the spike emission. And with this in hand, right, we can go to it like there's a there's a machinery that's been developed in statistical physics, right? It's reviewed in, in those those articles, right, um, to calculate right kind of uh, expansions for any any joint moment of the membrane potentials or spike trains that you want, right? Um, so, for example, we can calculate this this joint second moment between the uh, the membrane potential and spike trains um, for our our resets, right? If we want to talk about single neuron activity. Uh, and we can derive kind of nice, cute little analytical approximations of those terms um, uh, using this kind of machinery of, of this diagrammatic machinery of Feynman diagrams. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through all the details right there. There isn't time, right? But there's a, a standard machinery for doing this, right, is, is the, message, the message I want to get across. Um, and if I learned it, so can you. <laughs> um, we can also calculate like the variability of the membrane potentials um, in a similar fashion. You can calculate the right the, the correlation between spike trains, and again, that get kind of nice, uh, right, simple uh, approximations for those. I do want to take a second just to say what these these things are, right? So these things that I'm calculating right now are these second moments that show up in the dynamics of the mem of the mean, right? We had from the Taylor expansion of the um, of the spike emission, the spike intensity function, right? We had a, the second moment of the membrane potentials, right, showed up, the second cumulant, sorry. Right? So that cumulant tells us how pairwise covariability between inputs affects the output, right, of our neuron. And we can understand that effect in a very simple model here, where we have a neuron, um, it's threshold linear, and we live above threshold, right? So it really, I'm saying it's linear. And the total spike count of that neuron, right, is just the integrated input that it receives. Uh, and its inputs have a synaptic weight of two, right? So each input gets multiplied by two, and we just integrate those, right, over time um, uh, to determine the total spike count. So if we receive four spikes, right, two each from two, two from each of two presynaptic cells, right, the total output of that neuron, right, is four. Um, similarly, right, we could line those spikes up, right, perfectly in time, right, and again, right, have a total output of four, right, and we can compare this now to what happens when we have a nonlinear intensity function. So now again, if we receive four total input spikes that are non-coincident, right, then the total output of this neuron is, right, you can go through the algebra, is four again. But now if we line those spikes up, right, in time, okay, we line them up, right? Now each input has, a, has an effective weight of nine, right? Our intensity function here, right, has a threshold at one, right? So that's, right, like uh, you multiply it by two and then you subtract one. Um, 
So the total output of the neuron now is right is 18. So here, right, the synchrony, right, of the, of the spikes between these two cells, right, has, has really dramatically affected the output of this neuron. Right, and that's the kind of effect that we're describing, right, with these kind of loop corrections to the mean, right? So we have kind of a, a coupling, right, between statistics. So higher order statistics of the activity impact lower order statistics, right? And this kind of, this, this path integral machinery gives us a way to calculate those higher order statistics and that coupling. All right. So we can do that, right? And you can go and calculate if you want to, to study kind of uh, rate dependent or reward modulated plasticity or, or uh, supervised plasticity, right? You can use this machinery to, to calculate those higher order correlations and how they drive synaptic plasticity. I'm not going to do that myself right now. I wanna do something a little bit simpler, right? We know here, right, that there are nonlinearities, right, in synaptic plasticity, right? There are effects that are not described by the classic kind of pair-based spike timing dependent model I, I told you about before, by classic kind of Hebbian-based models. So I'd like to take a step back and a really big step back. Um, I want to take a step back even from spiking neurons, right, and study just a, a, a um, for a few minutes here, just a very simple kind of generalized Hebbian learning rule, where we have a, a neuron. Gabe, one uh, quick uh, interruption just before you do, I just wanted to give you a heads up. This is roughly 30 minutes now that you're into your talk. Just so you Thank know. you. Yes, I'll, I'll be done in, uh, soon. Yeah. Um, thanks for your time. Right, so, so I'd like to take a step back, right, from spiking, Stumpy, just a, ver a very sim sim bleh, sorry, a very simple generalized Hebbian learning rule. And so we have a neuron, it receives inputs x1 through xk, right? Each of those gets multiplied by some synaptic weight, uh, and that determines the output of our neuron. And now we have a learning rule, right, that takes that output raised to some power a, right, times the input xi, right, raised to some power b, times the current synaptic weight j sub i, raised to some power c, right? And that tells us how the, the strength of, synapse, of the projection i is going to change, right? So if you took these powers a and b to both be 1 and c to be 0, right? So you just had presynaptic activity times postsynaptic activity. That would be the classic Hebbian learning rule, right? So this is a Hebbian rule with, with kind of higher order dependency and weight dependence. And we'll combine this rule. Um, with a, a kind of homeostatic synaptic scaling, right? A normalization of the total magnitude of this vector of synaptic weights. And now, following um, Eric Dioya's work from back from the 80s, right, we can again make this kind of slow learning approximation to derive a, a differential equation governing the synaptic weights. So here, right on the left hand side, we have the, the rate of change of synaptic weight i. And there are a few kind of terms that appear on the right-hand side that I want to say what they are. So the first is these mu's, right? So these mu's are higher order correlations of the activity, right? Of the, of the inputs, of the input activity. So um, mu sub i alpha, right, is the expected uh, value of xi to the power b, right? That comes from that input dependent term in the learning rule, right? The xi to the b, right? That's the same term. And then you have x times xj times xk, right? You have some other number of indices that are showing up in this tensor, right? It could be a, a matrix. There could be only one. We stop at xj. Or there could be two more indices, xj, xk, or, or more. How many there are depends on what that power a was, right, for the, the, the postsynaptic um, dependence in our, in our learning rule, right? So basically each power A gives rise to another uh, factor of the inputs um, in this, this moment, right? So if you have, um, uh, if A is two, right, then this thing is a third order tensor. Right? Um, and now J, right, the, the multiplication we have is by J to the, um, to the circle times A, Right? And that circle times is just an outer product. So this is just saying that on along each dimension of that correlation tensor, after the first, we take a dot product with the synaptic weight vector. That's all that's happening in that first term of these of these um, weight dynamics. And the second term basically comes uh, from that that weight uh, normalization, 
So again, right, that learning rule, if we take A and B both to be one and no weight dependence, C to be zero, right? The learning rule reduces to the classic Hebbian rule and these dynamics would reduce to Oya's rule, right? Oya right, took the classic Hebbian learning rule and combined it with, with weight normalization. Um, and, uh, and back in the 80s, whoop, my slides seem to have frozen. Oh no, please don't tell me they're frozen. At least I can still hear you. Aha, okay. Um, <laughs> back in the 80s, um, Eric e. Oya, uh, along with Yua Karunin, proved right, that, um, that, that uh, a linear neuron endowed with, with heavy and learning would learn principal components of this input, right? We can see up top here, right, this, that simplified uh, heavy inversion of these dynamics, right, in that special case. Uh, and the steady states of that are the, the matrix eigenvalue eigenvector equation for the, the second moment mu of the inputs. Um, and this is the point where, unfortunately, we have a, I had a technical glitch and um, I would show you a truly amazing video demonstrating this fact. Um, and you'll just have to take my word for it that it's, you would, you would be completely floored by how amazing that video was. Um, so Hebbian learning, right, uh, lets, a, lets a neuron learn p uh, principal components of the input. So what about this, this kind of nonlinear Hebbian learning? Well, we can still write down a steady state equation, right, for this generalized Hebbian learning rule. Right, and it sort of has a similar kind of flavor, right, to the the matrix eigenvalue eigenvector equations, um, right. We have that the synaptic weight vectors are invariant under the action of the multilinear map defined by that higher order correlation tensor, right, up to right uh, some scaling by a factor lambda, and some element wise exponentiation. Right by a factor of one minus c. C was the right how the um, the current synaptic weight affected the learning dynamics. So that we have kind of a a, a generalized uh, family of invariants of the of the input correlations um, that are steady states of this learning rule. Um, right, and in two kind of particular special cases, this reduces to um, the uh, things that people have studied before, right? Different uh, flavors of tensor eigenvectors uh, and eigenvalues of that higher order input correlation. The tensor linear algebra, multilinear algebra is a whole kind of fun field. It turns out that um, there are different kinds, as I alluded to, of uh, eigenvectors of a tensor and different of these kinds inherit different subsets of the properties of matrix eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Um, We'll focus on we'll focus on one kind, right? When we ignore the weight dependence in the learning rule, right? The the family of invariants we got there, uh, which people refer to as as um, these E eigenpairs of a tensor. I have no idea why the E eigenpair what the E stands for. Um, and again, here I would show you a, a truly amazing video um, showing that uh, that these generalized heavy and learning dynamics actually do converge to a, a tensor eigenvector of these of, of naturalistic uh, image patches. Um, you'll just have to take my word for it again. Um, what we see in simulations is that these these generalized heavy dynamics don't always converge to the first tensor eigenvector, right? And back in the eighties, um, right, Eric Dioya and Yuo Karunin proved that for the regular heavy dynamics, they, the it always would. Right, it would always find the first principal component of the inputs. So there are two options here, right? Either one, maybe I, my simulation is a little noisy. I have some finite learning uh, time scale. Maybe it's just trying to find the first principal component or the first tensor principal component, but it can't. Uh, or right, maybe uh, maybe it's not guaranteed to find the first tensor principal component. And it turns out that it's actually not guaranteed to. So we were able to prove in a, a fun little NeurIPS paper a couple of years ago uh, that each eigenvector, each of these uh, these E eigenvectors of the tensor um, of the input correlation tensor, is uh, an attractor, right, of these generalized heavy and learning dynamics with a non-vanishing basin of attraction, right, whose volume we can actually compute. Um, so for the details there, I'll, I'll refer you to the paper. Um, and with that, right, I'll, uh, I'll stop. So thank you for, for your attention. Um, I've, I've tried to touch on a, a few different kind of topics that, that I view as related um, and to highlight those, the, that relation, although um, 
I, I realized that the, there are there are some jumps in between them. Um, uh, the 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 references for the things I talked about are here, and of, of course many other people, um, including you know, many of the organizers and people in the audience, have, have worked on related questions. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd I'd love to hear them. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks a lot, Gabe. That was awesome. Uh, I mean, particularly enjoyed the last part. Um, so there are questions, um, and I'm trying to get maybe Sven, if you want to ask your question yourself, um, I'll invite you uh, on stage. If not, I'll ask it later. Um, so one question I had right in the beginning is actually, um, how dependent are doing this beautiful theory, how dependent is it on, on the neural model so that it's a nicely tractable one without, without memory? So if you have one with adaptation or something like this, um, how does this, in, because it, it messes with the correlations, right? On, in yeah. Kind of yeah, so this is a, uh, um, a strength of this, this approach, right? Is that we don't have to make um, a renewal assumption. We don't rely on any results of, of renewal theory. Um, we cannot, if our model is, re, is a renewal process, we can apply them, right? No problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we don't rely on it. So that's a, a particular strength of that whole pathing rule approach is you, you, adaptation is, uh, you know, in principle, no problem. Okay, so in principle, but how hard is it really? So when, once you do the math... Well, you just have another variable, right? Like I had um, uh, another variable or another uh, filter, I guess, depending on how you want to implement it, right? So if we go back... Uh, yes, here, um, right? So if you have, uh, for example, an adaptation that's just described by some, uh, the convolution of neuron eyes spike train with some filter, right? Like, so like a current, an adaptation current, right? Then you would just have another term in these dynamics, right? Which is the convolution of that adaptation filter or that, that's, uh, that post, -map, post spike filter with neuron eyes spike train, right? Yeah. So it would have a similar kind of form as the synaptic coupling, except it wouldn't you wouldn't be summing over all the neurons. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Cool. Thanks. Um, all right. Seems like I'll ask uh, Sven's question. So uh, Sven Gudike, who you probably know too, and um, he says um, and he says great talk. Do you think learning in the brain works by averaging over long times with plasticity mechanisms that are continuously active, which require small weight changes for each spike event? I could imagine that synaptic plasticity turns only on at certain instances, but then with stronger individual uh, changes. Yeah, that's a great point, right? So there's this whole kind of setup that I described at the beginning was, was based on this assumption of slow learning, <coughs> which has really been inspired right by... Um, Right by by experiments, slice experiments, right where under particular conditions, right the the experimenters really have to spend a whole bunch, right ten minutes or twenty minutes, right of of uh, activity, right to observe, right uh, to get an observable change in the postsynaptic um, potential amplitude. That might of course be very different than how things work in the brain, right? And there are all these fun, uh, right things like uh, behavioral timescale plasticity now, and these obs like observations of one shot learning, right? That that might be um, much faster, right? Yeah. Um, so the I'll say that the this this assumption of slow plasticity, right, to get averaging, right, you could equivalently view um, the evolution of the synaptic weight as a stochastic process, right, as a random variable. And then, if you want to describe the kind of expected evolution of the synaptic weight or or the variability of the evolution of the synaptic weight, right, you would again have, right, this, um, this link to moments of the, um, of the activity. Now, you might not have a separation of time scales where you can treat those, the, like, the synaptic weight matrix as fixed, right, and um, David Clark uh, from um, uh, Shuklet Unkumar and, and Larry Abbott's group at Columbia just had a really nice paper in a very simplified kind of rate network model Right, but kind of uh, taking out that separation of time scales, right, and doing kind of a, a, a consistent uh, dynamical mean field theory for the activity and the evolution of the synaptic weights. Um, that also, you know, you can use um, these same kind of approaches, the same kind of pathological approach to do. Um, 
So, uh, yeah. So that, that's that's what I'll say about that. Yeah. Very good. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, thanks, Ben. Um, so then we're running short on time, unfortunately. So I'll, I'll give you one um, uh, quick one uh, by Kareem Habashi, who, um, who asked, "Thanks for the talk. Do you believe pairwise potentiation of depression is local, in terms that it affects only one synapse?" Um, do I believe that biologically? No. No, um, that's the simplest, uh, well, the, the simplest kind of starting point for modeling, right, in this, in this framework, right, but there are, you know, we, we have experimental results showing that plasticity at neighboring spines is correlated, right, and that, uh, like, chunks of dendrite with, in which there are st strong spine, big spines, tend, tend to um, have spines that get, get bigger also. So part of the motivation for introducing weight dependence in that, that last section of the talk um, is to say that, well, maybe the, the synaptic weight in, in our model, right, maybe it's not the, 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 an individual spine, right, but maybe it's like a collection of spines from the same or from correlated presynaptic inputs, right, um, and the kind of net effect of those, of that group of spines is the synaptic weight that we have in our model. That's, that's the, um, the sort of hand wavy uh, way that I, I think of that. Um, but yeah, yeah there are absolute, absolutely interactions between spines. Right. But yeah, one has to do simplifications to do nice theory, obviously. Okay, great. Um, so unfortunately, there are more questions, but we don't have time anymore. So thanks a lot, Gabe, uh, for this beautiful talk. And um, so anybody who hasn't uh, gotten their answers to their question, you can just write uh, in the chat or email to Gabe, and, and I'm sure he'll be more than happy to answer. If yes. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much.